this event and uh, um, well, welcome all to my talk. So what I usually talk about, I usually talk about, you know, uh, a paper we wrote, uh, some problem we solved, uh, you know, some new perspective we found. Well, when I was invited to give this talk, and I, I know that there is very diverse audience interested in quantum computation, I uh, thought of uh, giving a talk about what's missing, because I, I think it's more interesting, you know, so why are quantum walks are being explored as a means for uh, some algorithmic speed up and why it may or may, may not work. And, you know, my view on how to um, approach certain, certain problems that uh, constructing a robust uh, quantum walk algorithm uh, requires. Definitely, uh, my talk does not involve any hardware. It's purely theoretical, you know, quantum Turing machine type of um, environment. So, uh, if you would like uh, to ask questions, please feel free to ask questions anytime during my talk. <clears throat> so first, I want to say what works, right? Well. We all know um, that uh, quantum Fourier transform works. So um, if you consider classical discrete Fourier transform um, as an n by n unitary matrix acting on an n dimensional vector, then on classical computer, it takes uh, order of n square iterations, we can say gates, uh, to perform such um, uh, an operation as Fourier transform. Now, uh, on uh, if, if you do fast Fourier transform, so if your uh, the dimension is a power of two, or in, if you can um, Com complement to a power of two, then you can do fast Fourier transform and that definitely is an algorithmic speed up um, <clears throat> and gives you an order of n log n uh, gates. Now, well, the lucky thing about um, the quantum world is that we are dealing with unitary operations. So, uh, Quantum Fourier transform only requires uh, log square, uh, order of log square gates, and that's already an advantage. Um, the uh, kind of the built-in properties of quantum com computers are helping you implement quantum Fourier transform so robustly, and then <clears throat> that means that you automatically get a speed up like this. You know, talking about fast Fourier transform because a quantum Fourier transform, uh, if, if you look at how it was constructed in 1994, uh, Copper Smith's paper, uh, you'll see that it, it was modeled after fast Fourier transform. And fast Fourier transform is considered one of the most important algorithms uh, um, that we have uh, for in the classical world, of course. And so uh, uh, here I gave a quote of uh, one of uh, um, well-known applied mathematicians, Gilbert Seng, as uh, saying that fast Fourier transform um, is the most important numerical algorithm of our lifetime. It definitely may be not the most important, but one of. Uh, and so, um, the quantum Fourier transform is equally revered in quantum computation. Uh, and, and I give two notable uh, examples. Uh, one is, of course, a short algorithm. And, you know, all the uh, codes that use phase estimation, uh, that, that they use, essentially you use a quantum Fourier transform. Uh, maybe an inversion of it, but um, you still use it. So that's 
one success story of taking essentially fast Fourier transform that was so successful in the classical world and transferring it to the quantum world. Um, what other algorithms are successful in the classical world? Uh, well, uh, one class of algorithms uh, that have been especially successful is randomized algorithms. And this algorithm would often achieve algorithmic speed up and in some cases uh, will uh, be the only means for solving a problem. But very frequently uh, will produce algorithmic speed up. And in fact, um, this is the world I'm coming from. I, I, I'm originally trained as a probabilist and statistician, well, more probabilisms. Uh, so um, statistician, uh, probability, stochastic processes, uh, statistical mechanics, um, essentially my world. And so there you use Markov chain Monte Carlo type of randomized algorithms to uh, uh, simulate uh, spin systems. And then when you do so, uh, definitely you need to know the running time because you uh, you want to know if it's a, a if, if it's a fast if it's a speedy algorithm, and uh, there the running time is quantified by um, what's known as mixing time, and so for me uh, it was one of the research goals to was to study those mixing times. Now, uh, what are randomized algorithms? Rand for randomized algorithms, you build a Markov chain that uh, all those starts with some initial uh, configuration, but evolves and uh, converges to the required uh, stationary distribution. Uh, so in a way that's um, uh, what it is. And then uh, it definitely it doesn't reach that stationary distribution. It can get epsilon close to that stationary distribution. And so you get, uh, oftentimes you get the answer uh, or is it the optimal uh, solution to a problem or close to optimal solution to a problem as you'll see in my slides later on, this probability one minus epsilon. But um, if you remember uh, Grover's algorithm, right? So uh, with the Oracle and, you know, uh, all, all, all that story where you achieve speed up of, you know, square root of n instead of n um, in the classical world, if you believe that uh, the unitary transformation that translates the oracle into quantum world is a fair translation. So if you remember in, um, if you have two qubits then uh, Grover's algorithm give, produces exact solution is probability one. But in all other cases, uh, it produces solution. Uh, when you do the measurement, uh, you get the right solution with probability close to one, but not one, some probability one minus epsilon. Well, this name is tr true about randomized algorithms. Okay. So, so what is the goal? Uh, if you are planning um, some kind of analog of quantum Markov chain or quantum analog of random walks, well, you, are, you, you want an algorithmic speed up. So that means that you're really planning um, an analog of um, randomized algorithm. And so a goal here is to find a quantum approach, approach uh, involving quantum walks or whatever you, algorithm you think is a quantum walks that replicates the success of randomized algorithms, right? So a fast Fourier transform tra uh, translated to a quantum Fourier transform uh, definitely achieved notoriety uh, in quantum world. Uh, so, um, Randomized algorithms implemented as quantum walks um, still in search of um, that um, perfect recipe. So I want to uh, go off the quantum world into classical world to explain how randomized algorithms are working there. 
and then come back to quantum world, explain the approach that we took, myself and collaborators, but then there's a related approach um, in many other papers. Uh, and, uh, and, and then uh, looking at this big picture, comparing the classical and quantum world, uh, you hopefully will see what's missing and maybe you, you will be able to uh, uh, have a, a bright insight which will lead to something, um, some approach that would uh, fix all the gaps. All right. So I want to talk about a Markov chain Monte Carlo randomized algorithm and the most famous of, the, of all is being Metropolis Hastings algorithm, but all of them are about of the same kind. So what, what are these algorithms after? You are, are given um, a complicated uh, sample space think of a net complicated network, network with complicated uh, connections. And then you want to simulate um, sampling from that sample space according to a probability distribution, call it pi of z. Now, the way you do it is you want to construct a Markov chain over that sample space, let's call it X sub T, uh, with some transition probability, uh, converging rapidly to its unique stationary distribution, pi of Z, okay? So now here's a complication. Uh, the stationary distribution, this function pi of Z, uh, over the configuration C in the sample space S is very difficult to describe. However, uh, there is a neighborhood structure in the sample space S. And if you compare the value of pi um, of any pair of neighbors, uh, Z and Z prime, and you then the ratio of the two values is easy to compute. You may not know pi of z, and you may not know pi of z prime, but you may still know the uh, ratio, and that's very easy to see uh, in the multiple examples. I'll give you hopefully two examples if time allows, um, just to gi give you the idea of complete complication, complexity of the problem. Um, so um, how do you construct that Markov chain? You uh, construct transition probabilities, uh, transitioning from state Z to state Z prime uh, through things you know, and the things you, you know how to compute are the fractions of uh, the values of pi for pairs of neighbors. So uh, uh, the probability for transitioning from Z to Z prime should be proportional to the minimum of one and the fraction of pi of uh, Z prime to, uh, uh, to pi of Z, All right? So, uh, and then you scale it. Well, you know that probabilities have to be less than one and uh, you know you want want to make sure that um, the probabilities for each given z if you're summing over z prime the probabilities should add up to one so definitely m should be large enough usually the boundedness of the degree in the network allows you to find m uh, fairly quickly so uh also, you uh, want to have a probability that uh, you go from Z to back to Z, and that will just uh, be the complement, right? Uh, so you sum all the probabilities for going from Z to any neighbor Z prime, and then subtract it from one, and uh, uh, that will ensure a few things. 
uh, first of all, the um, uh, uh, that uh, the probabilities add up to one. And uh, second, oftentimes you want the periodicity that is more comfortable for your computations. Well, this is not a problem when you do the quantum implementation most of the time, but still. Uh, well, if you do quantum work on Z, just standard uh, Hadamard quantum work on integers, then you do get that periodicity problem because uh, at even times, uh, the, um, uh, if you do the measurement, then uh, uh, it will be uh, even, uh, uh, one of the even numbered states over, um, so when you do the measurement after writing the algorithm, even number of steps, time steps. And if you uh, do the odd number of time steps, then, the pro then this probability one is gonna be one of the uh, states corresponding to odd uh, numbered vertices. But uh, here you, you often avoid it. There are ways to avoid it in both the classical and quantum world. Uh, it is not a problem in, when you do continuous uh, Markov chains or continuous um, uh, continuous quantum walks. So now what's important? Uh, it's important that from the way we constructed uh, the uh, quantum walks by taking this minima, and this minima is easy to compute, you can see that um, the Markov chain is reversible. That means it, and for the physicists, uh, um, it would mean that it satisfies the detailed valence condition. So that means that as you uh, continue uh, with that Markov chain, uh, the, um, then uh, the distribution of that Markov chain will converge uh, to that uh, of pi, right? So if you run long, the algorithm long enough uh, and then stop and look at where you are, it's a classical way of kind of corresponding to the measurement, then um, the distribution of your random walker will be uh, close to pi, some epsilon close to pi. Okay, so that's the way you simulate by uh, uh, creating this Markov chains and running them long enough and then uh, stopping where you are and, uh, and, and extracting the value, right? Uh, just looking at the way you would be in the sample space as after long enough um, time of running. So, now, let me explain what this uh, approach solves, what kind of problems, and, and then you'll be able to clearly see why this is so complicated when you get to quantum implementation. So, uh, one of the most probably famous example is knapsack problem. It's so famous that pictures are everywhere, so I decided not to draw my own, but I borrow one from Wikipedia. So imagine that uh, you are given um, a, a bound on the mass that you can carry in your knapsack, right? And then uh, the, there is a collection of objects which each associated with uh, some math and some uh, monetary value. And you want to optimize um, uh, very quickly optimize, pick the ones uh, uh, that uh, you, by filling your knapsack, you, you will still not exceed the uh, uh, cap on, on the carrying capacity of your knapsack. And yet you will maximize uh, the, um, the value that you're carrying, okay? So knapsack problem is a famous example of NP-complete problem. Uh, and so that means that essentially, unless you do randomized algorithm, the algorithm you, you arrive uh, going to 
take long time to run. Now, randomized algorithms you construct may not find, find you optimal solution, but uh, this very high probability will produce uh, optimal or near optimal solution. And then if, if it has a quick enough running time, you can run a bunch of times and then see if you arrive uh, with the same solution all the time or just, you know, statistically assess the likelihood if, of, of, of picking the right solution. So um, I don't want to go much into detail, but I want to show that this is exactly an example uh, where you may not know um, the target function pi of z, but you will know the fraction of pi of z prime over pi of z for uh, two neighbors, z and z prime. So uh, we are looking at uh, m objects and the collection of objects you will uh, consider is a vector. Uh, this vector is uh, the vector of zeros and ones. So you're talking about hypercube, of course. And um, zero means you're not taking uh, that item. And one means you take that item. You cannot take it twice because each of these items uh, is unique, right? So it's a vector of zeros and ones. Now, each item has a weight attached to it and monetary value attached to it, right? So you cannot look at all configuration Z because you only have to look at all configuration Z on the hypercube such that the corresponding weight, and that is just the dot product of W and Z, right, uh, is less or equal than the uh, maximal carrying capacity, right, uh, so that um, it does not exceed. So that's one dot product you look of, of uh, the vector W weights and vector Z of what you take and what you don't. And so that really uh, restricts your space. It's no longer as symmetric and beautiful as hy hypercube. It's essentially, uh, you have, uh, it's slanted with uh, a hyper, it's a hypercube slanted with hyperspace and then you take one side of it, right? And, uh, and then um, what are you trying to maximize? You're trying to maximize the utility function called u of z, which is a dot product of vector z, that is your selection, and the uh, value vector v, that is uh, essentially this is the, the uh, value uh, uh, corresponding to the collection of objects that you picked, uh, represented by vector z. Okay, so it's not an easy problem. Uh, let's see how um, classical algorithm approaches uh, this problem, uh, ran classical randomized algorithm. Uh, so uh, you consider a function, you take a, uh, uh, some value beta, usually you think of beta as inverse temperature, one over temperature. And then you will take uh, the exponen exponential uh, function of u of z, so u of z was the, the function that you were trying to maximize the utility function, the, the value. Uh, and then you multiply it by beta and exponentiate it. So obviously the maximum of this function, uh, this function is going to be uh, the same as of u of z beta is positive, right? And then you want it to be converted into um, 
a, prob a, a, a probability distribution function. So you divide it by uh, the sum of this exponents over all configuration Z. Uh, now this is called partition function. Uh, now we don't hope to find a uh, partition function. It's, it's a very complicated thing and lots of physical and mathematical papers are written about uh, partition functions. Uh, well, we, we, we are not interested in those. Why? Because if you take two neighboring configurations here, and what are neighboring configurations? Uh, two configurations will be neighboring if uh, their vector z uh, matches at all except for one coordinate, right? So maybe in one configuration you included an item and another you didn't include that item, like J's item, right? But then notice that, well, the dot products that you are exponentiating right here, because these are dot products, they will differ only at one value for the two neighbors. So pi of z prime over pi of z is very easy to compute there, right? That means that you can have that minimum for all pairs. Therefore, you can have the transitional probability, okay? And that means uh, you can have your randomized algorithm. And, uh, and here he, he is the reason why, because for two neighbors, uh, uh, well, Z and Z prime, this is just a, a vector which has all zeros except for uh, one coordinate. It could be plus or minus one or zero, right? And so this exponent is very easy to find without knowing partition function, without knowing all of the things. Uh, so you do have a convergence of that randomized algorithm to um, uh, that um, um, you have that convergence to uh, the uh, stationary distribution, right? The Markov chain uh, in distribution converges to pi of zero, right? the distribution of um, Markov chain after t iteration is uh, at some point very close to pi of z. And, uh, and, and then uh, how, when is it close to pi of z? Well, if beta is uh, very large, then it takes longer time, but your answer will be very close to optimal or optimal because this function is very sharp pointed at um, uh, near the optimal solution. If beta is, uh, if beta is small, close to zero, that means because beta is uh, inverse temperature means in hot temperature, uh, uh, then you, 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 there is a very high probability that you'll err, but the algorithm is, is fast, right? So, uh, that, then um, there are two things that I want to point out uh, in regard to this. One, uh, the mixing time characterizes the running time of such algorithms. Um, and then there is this notion of uh, approach of simulated annealing. And that means that your temperature uh, does not have to stay fixed. The beta equal to one over temperature you may start with a uh, much higher temperature where uh, the random walk is very diffusive. And then once it spreads out, then uh, um, you will slow gradually um, uh, change the temperature. You, you, you will gradually cool down and then uh, the walker will be trapped close to the optimal solution. So you use both diffusivity of um, the uh, large temperature and then you will use uh, the um, 
precision of the uh, cooler temperature. Okay, so there's some information of where uh, the uh, simulated annealing came from, what publications. Now, so the, 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 these are all the all the aspects that we need to know. I was hoping to go through one more example, and that is uh, deep sampling for Ising model, which is you know one of the funnest things to do in quantum, uh, not in quantum, in statistical physics. Well, and it, it is related, of course, to quantum world, but I'll skip over that because I gave one example. I think one is too many. Uh, so I want to get back to quantum world. And then um, I want to uh, talk about the interchange framework that we used uh, for quantum works. Um, in our paper, 2011 paper, uh, with uh, you know some of my students and uh, co-authors, and so <clears throat> what did we do there? We wanted to consider uh, the more general um, definition of discrete quantum work than you, was usually given with a coin so that we could study quantum work on various networks, say starting with binary trees, and that's where uh, uh, we um, did most of the work. So how does this interchange network work? Well, you can see the uh, simply connected uh, graph or, 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 or network uh, with you know, usual notation, vertices, uh, set of vertices, set of edges, and let end with the number of vertices. And um, so, so n uh, will be represented in our case by pure states. Uh, we construct a quantum work that is uh, some evolution now, each, at each time t, our psi of t is a summation of over um, i and j, i and j representing uh, pairs of vertices in the network. And then you'll have c i j of t uh, and, and the uh, product of i and j representing the pair, okay? So how does this psi of t evolve? It evolves according to the interchange approach. So what is it? The approach is modeled after memory to um, uh, classical uh, Markov chain. So what is memory to Markov chain? Mar memory to Markov chain is where before uh, deciding where you go next, unlike that uh, um, uh, just standard memory one Markov chain, you just only look at your position now and decide where you go next. So you're completely memoryless. Here the, you have memory too. So you remember where you are now and where you were one step, time step earlier before you uh, decide uh, where you go next using that information. So in a way uh, you're working with an error, right? You remember the position of your error so how do you we represent that error? Well, we represent it by i times j. So uh, we, uh, each, each iteration going from time t to time t plus one, uh, we multiply our state by an interchange operator x and then uh, another unitary operator u. So what do they do? The interchange operator uh, goes like this. So for uh, each uh, i and j, it swaps them. So i j, uh, this vector i j is uh, swapped in the direction. Obviously, uh, this is uh, just changing uh, permutating the basis, so obviously X is a unitary transformation. Again, as you may see, you go from the error going from I to J to 
error going from J to I. And then there is operation U, uh, which says, well, let's do projection on J, right? And that is projection uh, on J on the uh, first n-dimensional um, complex space. And then what do you do with the second uh, part of the vector, second, uh, 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 the other n dimensions. Uh, what you do is uh, you apply uh, the operator u sub j, that is identity for all non-neighbor state, uh, non-neighbor uh, indices to, to, so if, if, if the indices are not neighbors to j and therefore is restricted to the uh, only the dimension which is equivalent to the number of neighbors of j and there you reselect where you you use this um, uh, uj to reselect where the um, uh, the arrow is pointed at right so Obviously, of course, it, uh, it will be, uh, uh, you know, path integrals that you'll be talking about, but what, what happens here is uh, now you uh, apply this unitary transformation that, that, that has non-zero values for, for, for this many errors, although originally, if you just restrict to uh, this, this vector, it was uh, just a pure state, okay? So, so in a way, uh, first step was switching the error and second step was reselecting where the error is pointed. Of course, in the path integral uh, interpretation of it. So uh, now you will, if you consider the uh, binary, Three. So binary tree is a uh, is a tree graph where all but the root vertex are uh, degree degree three. So each vertex has three um, neighbors. So as a way of selecting uh, evenly over those, we use uh, this uj local for uh, neighboring configuration neighboring um, points on the graph and identity matrix over the rest of the points. So, and that's, that's the way uh, any discrete um, time quantum work progresses. And we, we showed, of course, that classical Hadamard work of this type, Zegedev work is of this type and all of them. And we found it a very, natural uh, framework for trying to bring the uh, randomized algorithms into quantum world. Although, of course, uh, uh, this being unitary dynamics implies that we needed to, um, we needed to, uh, uh, to um, model it, uh, well, more in a more complicated way, yet it, it still is, a Markov chain uh, approach, also it's memory to Markov chain, uh, restated as a quantum algorithm. So now here's the main, main part. Um, I knew that I will not make it into exactly 40 minutes, but close to. So uh, quantum walks, what's missing? So most important, uh, we are supposed uh, to use this knowledge, no knowledge of the ratios. We will not know the, the distributions pi. And you can do that, but if you're building a unitary operator, then you have to calculate all of these fractions, right? And if you do so, uh, then, then, Automatically, even just you know preparing uh, the uh, unitary operators that you want 
uh, you're still going to spend more time than than you would want to and the, and the operator is going to be also huge so it's not it's not going to help us in the way that randomized algorithms help in a classical world yet we believe that uh, this uh, in, interchange framework with uh, localized unitary operators uh, can still uh, be uh, organized so that uh, we achieve flow uh, we achieve, we achieve some part of that speed up phenomenon. The other part is, of course, this unitary dynamics. Um, you know, uh, uh, we know that um, running time is an issue, right? We want to know when to stop. There will be no uh, slowing down towards the uh, desired answer as in the, you know, L, L1, uh, uh, preserving dynamics of um, Markov chain because you know you are in in quantum world so it's of course L2 uh, preserving so uh, yet we, we uh, think by modeling the analog of simulated annealing in the quantum world uh, we are at the abatic approach we may get uh, close to uh, to that desired um, property and uh, we've, we've played with that notion. So I've listed some papers where we uh, made the quantum walk a non uh, time homogeneous or we try to make a mark of chain dynamics more adiabatic so that it will be more readily converted into quantum walk, walk type of algorithm. So I'll stop here because these are the main questions that I hope I explain the uh, complexity of um, converting ran randomized algorithms into quantum and um, that's where I stop. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Yevgeny. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, <clears throat> I have a question. Go ahead. In Grover algorithm, we have the oracle. And I yeah. understand that here you also need oracle. Can you comment how this oracle differs from Grover oracle? Well, uh, so, so what was Grover's uh, oracle? It was essentially a reflection, right? You would reflect over the pure state that was uh, the answer, right? Yes. Uh, here, uh, this this uh, UJs, they're more uh, serving as uh, points and they could be different at every different state J. So essentially at every state J, you have a different Oracle. And, and then uh, things get more complicated, but hopefully that complication will produce a more, 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 more interesting speed up. Yeah. So this, this means that the controlling classical computer creates for every time new oracle, which can also take some time. Of course. So when you yeah. evaluate complexity, are you taking into account time for the classical computer to create a new oracle? Uh, when, uh, for, for the classical computer, uh, creating uh, an analog of what you say, new oracle is very easy because at every step, it's like uh, there is decoherence. It's imagine you, you walk with decoherence, right? So every step you, you make a measurement and start a new. And then there it was very easy. Let me go back to the example because say knapsack problem, uh, you would just know if you are at state Z and then you look at every neighbor Z prime and you'll find the probability. So essentially that's your uh, that's your oracle, that is your coin in a way, which tells you with what probability you go where. You, can, you could do the uh, quantum walk that we describe here, the same way every time stopping for decoherence, of course, then it will be exactly the, uh, um, uh, exactly the, uh, um, uh, uh, the classical um, randomized algorithm. That's the word I was trying to remember. 
It would be exactly randomized algorithm from the classical world. We want uh, to have a speed up uh, over the classical world, like the quantum Fourier transport form, not only it modeled after fast Fourier transform in classical world, but they also provided speed up with, with the you know, built-in uh, you know, uh, unitarity of all the um, uh, uh, you know, evolution there in the quantum computer. So th that's what we are hoping to achieve. Now, uh, in our case, before we do the measurement, we essentially have to keep in, in all of our oracles, these guys, right? And that would, that would be very consuming. So that's exactly what's missing. I hope I answered your question. Are your slides available? Because you skipped many slides with examples. Can we yeah, get the access to all your slides? I, I will send them to Mark. OK, and, thank you very much. I'll yeah. make them available. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Are there any other questions? OK, well, uh, well, thank you again, Evgeny. And uh, again, All I've right. recorded this, and I'll be posting it tonight. Yes, is there a question? OK. Uh, okay, so yeah, thank you again, and uh, I'll see you all again in two weeks. Thank you all for coming. Goodbye.